Yo, welcome to this episode. Today we sit down with Luke Stokes. Luke Stokes is someone that's been in this blockchain ecosystem for a long while. He started as a developer, moving to Puerto Rico, uh, started buying Bitcoin. He bought two and a half Bitcoin for $50. So if you look at today's value, you can figure out that was a long time ago. He's actually been very involved with the Steam blockchain, where he's run a witness, is one of the most outspoken Steam community members that also move now to Hive. We go into discussion with what happened with Steam and why Hive was born and how it was born and how he sees Steam and Hive working together. Uh, he's also one of the major players in EOS, with he, where he runs one of the larger proxy, Luke Stokes. And he's also one of the members of EOS DAC, which is the the first real DAC organization that is actually working to enabling you to create a DAC for your organization with the DAC factory, which is coming very soon. They're just finishing up this work. So that's also very exciting for me to know. And now they are they have launched something called FIO. FIO is an AOSIO based blockchain that is here to enable every user out there to be able to uh, use blockchain payments of all cryptocurrencies so with your fio address you can have anders at neo and you can receive bitcoin ethereum wax uh, eos fio all of these different cryptocurrencies there is no limits to what you can receive on this you can well let's dig into this episode but first before we do that let's uh, like comment subscribe share this video support me it's a little effort from you it gives me a lot of value and let's find out about how, how fio will enable users all over the world to adopt crypto in a smooth and effortless way Yo, welcome to today's episode. Today we have Luke Stokes here, uh, a guy that uh, is well known in the EOS IO ecosystem and has recently launched their own pro uh, project. So that's very fun. So Luke, uh, tell us a little bit uh, your, about your background. Where do you come from? Thanks, Andrew, so, for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I, I grew up in Huntington Beach in California, majored in computer science. I've always been excited about computers, technology, all that. Uh, did a bunch of different things, ran a company called Foxy Cart for about 10 years. It was an e-commerce shopping cart company. So uh, my business partner and I built that and you know, got really involved in the whole payment space. So seeing how credit cards, merchant providers, payment gateways, that whole thing works. Around 2013, actually 2012, started to hear about this fake internet money, this Bitcoin thing. And I'm like, what is this all about? And in, in 2013 in January, you know, I just got super excited. I spent 50 bucks and I bought two and a half Bitcoin. For <laughs> nice price. Bucks. So that was a good price. And, and I just started going, you can, I have a, a post on, on a Hive where you can go and see my tweets every month that year in 2013. And it's just an amazing like time capsule to see what my thoughts were and you know the pumps and dumps when it went from 130 to 50. And I was like, it was like raining outside. I'm like, hey kids, get in the car. We're going to buy more Bitcoin. And I bought it <laughs> with some more at 50 bucks, you know, and then watch it go to 1200 and crash to 250. And just, you know, it was just an amazing ride. And through that process, I kind of, uh, you know, got a little, I started a, a Bitcoin meetup group in Nashville. I was living in Nashville, Tennessee at the time and got a lot of excitement in 2013, 2014. But then there was also like this disillusionment, right? With the block size debates and all the drama and the lack of governance on chain became a very serious problem. I remember uh, in 2013 when there was a fork of the Bitcoin chain and they won't call it a fork, but I was there watching it in IRC and it was a fork because they had pushed out a new version of one of the QT clients that allowed larger blocks and the old ones didn't and you had this fork, right? But then I watched that whole community come together in their own selfish interest, do what was in the best interest of the entire network. And I'd never seen anything like that in a decentralized way. All these people shutting down their exchanges, payment gateways, whatever, to, to solve a problem. And in, in the centralized world of payment systems that I was familiar with, it just blew my mind. I was like, I was telling my wife, I'm like, this is going to change over the, change the world. This is incredible. So the, fast forward a little bit in 2016, got involved with the Steam blockchain. And I was really excited about the on-chain governance that they had built with DPoS. And it got me interested in other... Prior to that, I was just like kind of Bitcoin maximalist. You know, there wasn't really much else out there that interests me. But I was also frustrated that everyday people weren't using Bitcoin. I was trying to educate people 2013, 2014, 2015. And it's like, nobody cared. They're like, it's too complicated, too confusing. What are these big hashes? They don't make sense. 
And so, you know, I, I, I got excited about, a, man, everyone knows how to blog. That's really easy to do. And look, here's people blogging and they're getting crypto and they're actually transferring it back and forth. Human readable names, you know, in the Steam account. So they're like, that's cool. And then uh, through that process, eventually they convinced me to be a block producer. They call them witnesses there got to know a little bit more about DPoS and what Dan's been working on with BitShares and things like that. And kind of got recruited by a couple of different block producers when EOS IO was coming out. Uh, almost joined EOS New York's team. I love those guys. Those guys are great. Uh, was like really close to just fully going on board with them. But then the EOS DAC guys came along and they're like, we're building DACs and DAOs. We're going to be a DAC enabler. And I was just like, oh my gosh, there's nothing cooler than decentralized autonomous <laughs> communities. How can I not get involved? So so I got involved with that. I ended up selling my business in 2018 back to my business partner so I could focus full time on consulting and blockchain stuff. And then a little after that, got involved in FIO, the Foundation for Interwallet Operability, which is my main uh, passion right now, the thing I'm most focused on. And it's really a service layer for the entire crypto industry. So no longer, no matter what token or chain you're using, you have to worry about public addresses. I can just have Luke at Stokes. I can do FIO requests with FIO data you know, secure, private, self-sovereign, decentralized mechanism that I'm, I'm really passionate about. And I think it's going to open up the floodgates of mass adoption of cryptocurrency. So that's what I'm, I'm focusing on now. And uh, eventually as a consultant, got into becoming the chief decentralization officer is the term they gave me. And then in, in, in December, they asked me to be uh, the managing director for the nonprofit Cayman Entity for the foundation. We started reaching out to block producers, getting them to spin up. And uh, we ended up launching in March. We've got over 30, I think we have 32 block producers now, a fully decentralized network. And uh, uh, it's just super exciting, amazing project. So that was a whole lot uh, in a small amount. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and we will for sure dig into Theo more. We will have a, a major part about that. But uh, before we go from that, how did you go from being a, a computer scientist from Pennsylvania to growing veggies in Puerto Rico? Oh, yeah. So I, I, we've got this little tower garden that my friend actually uh, set up. And we loved it. Like it's, it's one of those things where the water comes down, you know, and the, the, you just don't have to do all this work. And so we, I was posting all these pictures of my cucumbers. Now we all got all excited about all these veggies that I've been growing. But I, I came to Puerto Rico after getting a little frustrated with like the way the whole world was going in the United States. I was like, okay, this U.S. dollar world dominance is not going to last forever. Uh, the level of freedom that is being encroached on is becoming very uncomfortable. And I was like telling my wife, I'm like, let's renounce citizenship and let's just go move somewhere. And she's like, uh, no, <laughs> we're not gonna just do that. Uh, so my friend who also is the tower garden guy, my friend, Sean, he, he's a lawyer and he was like, hey, Act 20 and 22, you get this great tax benefit. So you don't have to continue funding the military industrial complex that you so don't appreciate with your tax money. And you get to keep it yourself instead. And it's paradise, the people are amazing incredible rainforest and all these. So I was like, well, we got to check that out. So we visited in March, uh, came back in September and then ended up moving in December. And that was in uh, 2018. And then, so yeah, we've been here now all of 2019 and into, into 2020, my wife and my three kids. Absolutely love it. It's an amazing place. Yeah, I could I could really imagine myself living like that, especially here in Sweden when it gets cold and the winter and dark and uh... And and if we go into the taxes, well, uh, Swedish government love their taxes. Uh, oh yeah. Well, you know, you get everything for free, though, right? That's what I love when it's like really high taxes, but they but we get this for free. It's like, well, you're still paying for it. It's just yeah. You know. And and surely a lot of things that they actually use the money for is actually pretty good in Sweden, like the school system and the and the medical care and and the lowest standard of living is really good but they also abuse the the system and spend it on well at least and... you're not bombing people on the other side of the planet <laughs> right so there you got that going for you uh, uh, no we are still the weapons for them <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, there there is for sure some uh, some good good parts and, and bad parts in sweden with the with the tax system uh, and when you're in crypto uh, you you tend to notice the bad parts <laughs> Oh yeah. So I, yeah, it's probably worth highlighting for anyone in the United States. The, the opportunity in Puerto Rico is the best for any U S citizen available. It's really amazing. you literally pay zero capital gains. Now it used to be called act 20 and 22. So you set one up for yourself as an individual and one up for your business. Now it's, I think it's called act 60. They've changed certain things about it, but it's still an incredible opportunity. Uh, I definitely highly recommend if you're all in crypto and you think your gains in the future are going to be in capital gains via cryptocurrency valuation going up. I think a lot of us kind of feel that's inevitable. 
um, definitely check it out. It's pretty exciting. And kind of through that process, you know, I, I was hearing Brock Pierce talk about it quite a bit. I moved here after, um, so I moved here and actually met him after moving here, which is kind of funny. I met him at a conference, not even here in Puerto Rico in person, but he had known about what I was doing. I think I, I had one of the first proxies on EOS just because yeah. I was like playing around with how it works. And I put my bio up on the Aloha EOS page and everyone's like, oh, that's a cool bio. Yeah, I'll use him as a proxy. And at one point, it's like millions and millions of dollars of EOS were on my proxy. I was kind of shocked. I'm like, guys, I was just like, you know, learning how this works, but thanks, you know. And so through that process, kind of got to get to know um, Brock. He actually asked me to be part of something called the EOS Foundation, which we were working on for about, you know, six to nine months, trying to create some community cohesion outside of just what Block One was doing. And, and provide some value in that. And so that's been an interesting process as well. But there's there's a really cool group of people here, not just Brock, but others that he brings to the space in Puerto Rico. Crypto Mondays, I miss, you know, we're all in lockdown now, but I, I miss that. Such an amazing community every Monday night to hang out with. Yeah, and I, I could really use a community like that. If in, in my environment here, I have uh, I have my brother uh, that's also into crypto, is Eric from AO Sweden. So a lot of uh, people know him. Uh, but other than that, I have no friends at all that are interested in crypto, none whatsoever. Uh, I have one guy that started buying NFTs on Wax because he found that to be interesting uh, because he has actually made a lot of, lot of money from World of Warcraft trading uh, digital assets. So it was the same thing for him. So, so he understood yeah. it from the start. Nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so th th these Mondays would be really sweet here. <laughs> It's, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's for a while, it was kind of the only thing I'd left the house to do, you know, I'd be like super yeah. busy working and stuff. You know, my, we homeschool, so all of my three kids are here at home. My wife stays at home, but Mondays I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get out and just see my friends. And there would always be interesting people that uh, Pedro did a great job. He always doing a good job of bringing people together. We've done a few zoom calls, but it's just not quite the same. And that was back when all the zoom calls were getting zoom bombed. So it was just like yeah. craziness, <laughs> but it's a good community. Yeah, that, that sounds uh, sounds amazing. Um, and let, let's move on to the before we move on to the next the, the big part. I want to go into Steam, but first I want to ask a question that I ask everyone that comes here, and it has a little bit to do with the veggies that you are growing. So, what is your first food memory? Oh wow, my first food memory. My memories are like so terrible that I don't even know if I could if I could come up with one. My first food memory. I, I would say probably my earliest recurring food memory would be Honey Nut Cheerios. Like, I mean, just you know, <laughs> that cereal, didn't matter what time of the day, night, whatever, Honey Nut Cheerios was my jam. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if I can remember my very, very first food memory. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, and, and it is hard. I, I know uh, some of the answers have been on the first thing that come to their mind or, or things like that. So that's what you actually answered. So that's perfect. Um, and now, Let's dig into Steam. I know that you were a big advocate for Steam and I was I was using it a lot, a lot for a while when I was traveling with my girlfriend to Shine and everything. We were blogging on Steam and I did it for some some gaming stuff that I was doing for a while. Uh, so I love the platform and I know that you used to love Steam. What happened? I would say I still do, but I don't call it Steam anymore. I call it Hive. And this is a really interesting, there's a philosophical discussion. We could, and Eric and I would probably geek out about this as well. I love talking philosophy with Eric. The idea of the ship of Theseus. You know, if you, if you, if you have a ship and you replace the mast because it's broken, and then you replace maybe the keel and you replace the rudder and you start replacing pieces on this ship. And then eventually all the pieces have been replaced, but it's still the same ship, right? Mm -hmm. But little did you know that those pieces were kept and they were actually reused to rebuild the ship. The broken pieces rebuilt it and now you have two ship of theses essentially it goes into identity question of how do you really identify something so some in the community would disagree with me but i i make the argument that hive is the steam blockchain that was renamed to hive as of hard fork 23 and the reason why i say that is as i've learned about these different ecosystems what's what's being called layer zero security which is the human beings that choose to either purchase a token in proof of stake or purchase a token and vote in delegated proof of stake or purchase electricity and mining servers to farm in proof of work. The, the people that believe a network has value and choose to put their efforts into that network are what give it value. So it's their shared belief, their shared storytelling of value, that layer zero security that defines the network. And so when Justin Sun attacked Steam, and really it was before that, it was Steam Incorporated and, uh, you know, 
I won't get into all the drama, but Ned Scott and others, a year prior to this happening, we were this close as a community to forking out their stake. It was that bad. It was so detrimental to the network. We're like, you promised us this 80% ninja mine was going to be used in this way. And you've been basically filling your pockets with it. And you're not delivering as far as your promises. And there were people threatening to say, hey, let's null out their keys. And of course, I'm a believer in private property and in sovereignty and all that. So I was like, guys, as a, as a block producer, I can't support that. But I agree, people are frustrated. So they kind of threw us a bone. And for the next 12 months, it was like, oh, look, we're doing this you know, a uh, STEAM proposal system, or do, they, they showed some improvement, right? And they, they, Ned stepped down and they had another person running the show. She was doing okay. And then, you know, but, but essentially it was the same problem is the centralized distribution in a DPoS network becomes a very serious uh, governance issue. And, and then they basically tricked finance and, and uh, the, the exchange that they own to vote. And so they basically voted, Sybil attacked the chain and controlled all the nodes. And at that point, it really became provably a private database controlled by one person. I mean, he literally, if he didn't like you, you'd go from number one all the way to 50. You know, it was just clearly not what Steam originally is. So the, all the people that were, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say all, but majority of the people that were excited about Steam, called it Steam, moved over to Hive. All the applications, almost all the applications moved over to Hive. You mentioned gaming, like Steam Monsters, these things, they're all moving over to Hive. And, uh, Peak D, you know, all these things now that have come up. And so for me, it's, it's, it's the exact same community, the exact same, all my content is there, everything, all my keys, everything is still there. And Steam is kind of an older version that I don't talk about much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and for the user, everything you have done before is on the, same, is on the new place. So, so for you, it's just to go to another domain and, you, and use, the, the, use it in the exact same way you, you did before. But you can also take the steam you had before and sell it and buy hype with it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's actually what a lot of people have done. They've just dumped and I've, I've pretty much, I'm pretty sure I've sold all of my steam at this point because it is, it's a centralized database. And I say that in, in I have friends of mine who've literally had their blockchain account censored and their, their token stolen from them. And so it's like, it, it's, it's not a functioning blockchain anymore. It's not Byzantine fault tolerant. And it's one of those things that I feel it's important to educate people on to say, you know, these, these systems are only as secure as our, you know, decentralized efforts to secure them. And that means good token distribution. That means, you know, people being able to purchase tokens to participate in governance. So along those lines, the next hard fork for Hive will include a, a cool down period. Basically, you'll have to wait 30 days when you power up a bunch of tokens to want to start voting before that impacts your voting weight. So in the future, we'll be able to see these attacks coming from a long way out. And, and actually change our votes to prevent that from happening. Yeah, that's, that's a, an interesting way to do it, for sure. And I think it's really important too, with everything we're seeing in the world today, that like decentralized social media that's immutable and provable is really important. We're seeing so many people get demonetized, get deplatformed, and people are trying to share information that they believe is important. Uh, they're not even allowed to have a dialogue in a lot of ways and in a lot of ways. And that's where I just think more and more, if we can't control our, our ability to speak and have hope. No, I think you're back now. Am I back? Yeah, we just lost right, the, the last uh, yeah, that 20 happened seconds. once before earlier today. So, so the, the pros and cons of Puerto Rico, <laughs> perhaps you don't have the, the high speed internet that we have in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually wonder if it's my equipment. I've been having some oh. issues with my mic today, so it might be it. Yeah. But I was just saying, I, I really, I value Hive existing. And prior to that kind of fork from Steam to Hive, I don't know that I fully on a regular basis appreciated the value of this immutable record of my content. The idea of thinking, oh no, it might go away someday, uh, yeah. was really refreshing in terms of recognizing the value of what I put into Hive, how much I appreciate it existing. Yeah, and that's amazing. Um, I probably I should probably start to share my my stuff there as well. Uh, I used to do it on Steam, and then I just got lost and and, and stopped logging in. And actually, what I did, I had some Steam, and I I used most of them to uh, for Splinterland. <laughs> I've got I've got a gold legendary. Uh, I forgot exactly which one it is, but I've got like a gold legendary Alpha uh, card, and yeah, I I put a, a bunch of Steam into Splinterlands. Really cool really cool project the guys there yababit and and uh and uh oh, i forget his name those guys are amazing they've done a really good job with that yeah and and, and, and they they yeah they seem really open and it, it's a it's a good project they keep on keep on building and keep on improving so yeah. I, I if i can support 
projects that help engage the community, I'm happy to do so with my money as well. Um, so that's great. And if we move on from Steam, then we go to EOS, which you already mentioned that you, 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 I think your proxy is still running and you still have a few tokens uh, proxy to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, as I said, I was just trying to learn how the proxy process works. I am a big you know, advocate for decentralized governance and really thinking about the proper ways to do governance. I'm also part of uh, the DevDAO, which is a Casper Labs project exploring different governance options. I'm part of the IEEE uh, group on governance standards for blockchain. I'm, I'm, so I've just kind of get looped into these different projects. Uh, people start throwing around labels as far as governance and myself <laughs> that I chuckle at. But, but I am passionate about this stuff. And I, I feel like not a lot of people are because it, you need this incredible connection of a lot of different things to understand blockchain governance. You need the technical understanding of the blockchain consensus mechanisms themselves. You need an understanding of human psychology and motivational psychology. Why do people do what they do? And the understanding of economics, as far as like the, the money flow within the system that impacts governance. And then you need you know, a larger understanding of philosophy and ethics and meta ethics and you know, how all that comes together to incentivize good action and good behavior and properly kind of protect against bad actors and, and what those attacks like civil attacks and other things might look like. So I, I call it crypto philosophy. It's kind of the mixture of all that stuff. I'm very, very excited about that. And working with EOS DAC, I, I was just, I'm really excited about solutions for providing that. And, and I know it's been a long road. It's been over two years, you know, waiting for the DAC factory to be live, but I, I don't know if there's been an official announcement, but I can say the first on mainnet DAC through the DAC factory has been created by Michael this past week. And I know he's working on that and that continuing to, you know, the team there is continuing to do great work. I've been helping uh, less so lately because of my activities with Theo, but I'm still just very passionate about that getting live. I've also been interested to see DACLify, which is another example of DAX on EOS mainnet uh, pieces and bits that first work with EOS DAC is working with that as well. So it's kind of interesting to see these experiments coming because I think a lot of people re realize in order to have something in the future that works in a decentralized way, you can't control it. You know, you have to let other people participate at the level they want to. The, the, the era of centralized entities that control everything, I, I think is gonna be challenged because you're gonna get a much more activated community that's motivated when they have personal ownership of what they're building. Yeah, and, and I think you're, you're correct there. And I, I really hope you're correct there as well because uh... We we need to take to get the power down to the people that actually are involved in what they are doing. Absolutely. Uh, and if we take what you just said, and and I have two questions. One is actually about FIO and governance, and one is about the DAC factory. So let's start with the FIO governance and go back to the DAC factory. Uh, how is that working with the FIO governance? Is it the same as as the other depot chains? Uh, will people run proxies? Let's give them some information here. Yeah, it's so we can talk about. I haven't even gotten into like exactly what FIO is yet. So we'll we will get to come that. there. <laughs> as far as the the governance of the chain, currently it's very very similar to EOS and most DPoS networks. Um, the main difference is the tokens are not stakeable, so it's more of a liquid weight, liquid vote weight. So the the tokens you have at the moment you vote is is constantly evaluated. So as you transfer tokens out, it's going to recalculate your vote, and that's going to be the vote weight. Uh, it's a similar kind of 21 block producer, active block producers with paid backups as far as the, the actual compensation for the block producers. There is proxying and the proxying is a little bit unique in that we want to incentivize all the value creators in the ecosystem to be rewarded for their efforts. So for example, I'll go into an example where we've already seen uh, centralized exchanges, for example, participate heavily in the governance on EOS mainnet. They run their own block producers and they vote. In some cases, they may vote with their user tokens or they may create an interface for their users to direct how they should vote, those type of things. And what's concerning about that is it doesn't empower the truly decentralized, non-custodial entities in the, in the space to do the same. And so what we've done, which I'm, I'm really proud of, is there's this idea called the TPID, the Technology Provider ID. They get a percentage of the fees. So this could be a wallet, an exchange, anyone interacting with the, the field protocol. But in addition, any tokens held into that wallet or software, could be a gaming platform, could it be DeFi, could be whatever you could, NFT marketplace, whatever, by default is proxied to the owner of that TPIP. 
So if a decentralized self-sovereign wallet comes out that's non-custodial and provides an amazing crypto experience and millions and millions of dollars of tokens are used in that wallet, then that wallet now becomes even overnight a major governance uh, player in the FIO space because a lot of people that own the FIO token have chosen to trust that wallet with their store of value. So that is a really, uh, really exciting innovation that we have based on how we built the TPID system. So ideally, the people that are adding the most value and the, those who are voting with their tokens as to where they want to store their tokens are going to be best represented in the governance of FIA. That That's sweet. So, so uh, anyone, can anyone start a proxy on FIO? Absolutely. It's just an on-chain command. You just, you know, fire it up and you can become a proxy. Same thing with the block producer. Anyone can become a block producer. It's an open network. There's no, uh, you know, restrictions or control. We, we do have a nonprofit foundation, which I'm the managing director for, but that's really designed in a way to kind of bring the community together, continue the development of the protocol in a more decentralized way. And then in the future, the token holders themselves will, and this is in the foundation documents of the, found, uh, uh, the formation documents of the foundation. I think there's three or four different voting periods throughout the year, the next one being in December. And, and it's designed to start next year in April, but we can actually start this earlier with unanimous agreement by the current board. But the idea is the token holders would be able to hold a straw poll as to who they'd like to be on the board and generate a list of the top 12. And then the current board will pick from that 12 to be the next nine that run the board for the next period. So it's going to be a really token governed system with a separation that's required by Cayman law. So it's not like direct voting, it's not a security or anything like that. It's purely utility token, but there's still gonna be a way to voice your perspectives on who should run the foundation. And the foundation, again, doesn't control anything on the blockchain itself, doesn't have any kind of direct influence on block production, but will create recommendations and provide value and help people understand who the good actors are, uh, help people avoid scams, things of that nature, uh, create criteria for how they can evaluate a good block producer. And then again, incentivize via the tokens that were allocated to the foundation for more integrations into the deposit and withdrawal area for exchanges and wallets and other any crypto enabled endpoint. Yeah, and that's good. And and with that said, uh, I just wanted you to put push it out because I will start a proxy as well to help govern the the block producer because I am deeply involved in the in the entire system. I'm part of one of the producers and I'm in all the conversations. I know the tech side. I know how this works. And I'm also a psychology major from start. So when you when you go into that, I also understand that aspect. So I will do that to help govern the chain as much as I, I can with the power and, and time I have with my hands. So. I super appreciate that. So give a shout out. What's your FIO address for your proxy? I will link it below and I will add it on screen. Uh, ah, beautiful. Yeah. And because I haven't decided exactly which one I will use. But I love that you're willing to participate at that level because one of the things we have now, we actually have more positions in, in, in as terms of block production rewards than we have active block producers. And so I'm, and also some of them as back as backups haven't been paid as much. So I really am excited to have some proxies engage in the ecosystem to be rotating their votes, make sure those backups get an opportunity to produce and make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to add value and get rewarded appropriately. Because I think there's some situations where they're doing the same amount of work as someone else, but they're not being recognized for that work. And so hopefully a rotation of block producers uh, will keep the system decentralized, keep it efficient and effective. That's what I'm hoping for. So uh, proxies are a great way to make that happen. Thank you for your service. Yeah, that's perfect. And, and rotating standbys is easy, easy, easily done and should be done frequently. So that's perfect. Uh, and now Deck Factory, you mentioned it, but uh, Perhaps people have no idea what that is. So what is a DAC factory? One of the main projects that EOS DAC has been working on as a DAC enabler is the idea that we can help DACs and DAOs be uh, super easy. For anyone Perhaps we should up. even stop there. What is a DAC and a DAO? Yeah, uh, great point. A DAC is a decentralized autonomous community, or sometimes you hear uh, decentralized autonomous corporation or company, or you'll hear the term DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. And it's really, there's you know no new things under the sun. It's not some new invention. It's basically co-ops. It's basically a group of people with a shared goal that has been done for a very long time, but it's being done on a blockchain. And this adds some properties to it that are really valuable. So you have immutability. Nobody can go and change the past. You have, uh, as far as the autonomous part of it, we talk about the smart contracts actually being provably deterministic, meaning you put in certain inputs, you're going to get certain outputs every single time. And it's not like, 
you know, Enron scandal. We have a separate set of books somewhere hiding in the back. You know, everything is transparent. Everything's there. Every vote for a custodian, every vote for a worker proposal, all the transfer funds and the locking of escrow and the permissions, you know, every week, uh, for example, on EOS DAC, as the votes change, the custodians on chain multi-sig, the 12 people that are on that multi-sig are updated in real time as the votes change and that voting period happens. So a DAC is a mechanism for really a group of people with a shared goal, building something where they all get to share in the ownership of it. And it's not like a centralized entity. And I'm really passionate about that being a solution for pretty much any group of people with a shared goal, whether you're a local municipality, a government, a corporation, a nonprofit, there's just endless opportunity for people to do things in a more efficient and transparent way. And so we, at EOS DAC, we're building tools like the DAC factory to make it very easy to create your own DAC. If you go to eosdac.io, you can look at more of the details there, but it should be like click, 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 you know, pay some EOS to set up the accounts and deploy the contracts and you're up and running. That's what we're going for. So, so it's plug and play for, for someone who wants to run a DAC. That is the, that is the goal. Yes. It's still like, you can check it on jungle testnet on the jungle three testnet right now. And it's still being tested in production, but we're, we're very close, closer than we've been in a long time. So it's very encouraging. <laughs> that, that's, that's very good. And, and in one way, this has been wor working before is like small communities, say, say a, a farm society, they are collaborating, they are doing things together. What you are doing is making this on with code and with voting and, and the contracts are provable and everything. So as you said, it's something from the past that is now bringing us to the future. And I think it's also really important specifically on EOS IO chains because the contracts are, are so mutable. And by mutable, I mean, you can modify them at any time, unlike Ethereum and others. And so you need a layer of governance. I actually personally believe every single token and every single application on EOS IO should be running as a DAC. If it's not, you're, you're, you're trusting someone who controls the private key of those contracts. So if you have a million dollar project, Whoever controls that private key can just change the code and take all your tokens, take all your money. And if you say, well, okay, we solved that with a multi-sig, I'm like, okay, that's helpful. That's a step in the right direction. So now you're trusting these individuals, but are they accountable? Can they be removed? If one of them or more of them are bad actors without a DAC voting model, you have no way to remove that. You have no constitution, for example, that you agree to a user agreement that says, if you do these actions, we as a community get to say, you can't participate anymore. So I do think it's really important that these governance models be thought through. And I've already, unfortunately, personally seen situations where projects, you know, they're able to censor people. They're able to, you know, uh, prevent yeah. someone from transferring their tokens, for example. And people freak out. They're like, wait, I thought these were my tokens. It's like, well, you have to understand the technology enough to recognize whoever controls that smart contract for that token contract controls your tokens also. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that's worth understanding that any token launched on any of these EOS IO chains, uh, chains unless they have given away the permission to that account, they can, they can update and change things. And you can check that on like blocks.io as a block explorer. You can see, you know, in the key section, if there's a single key there, you should be like, wait, who, who controls that key? If there's nothing, you know that it is an immutable uh, contract at that point. Another great example of the EOS DAC tool set that's being used is the Vigor DAC. Vigor is a really exciting DeFi project where they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff with multiple tokens, a stable token. Uh, there's ability to borrow and lend and all these neat things. And they use uh, the EOS DAC member client and the underlying contracts as far as how they manage the permissions on their, on their system. So it's pretty exciting. It's not fully public yet. So there's certain pieces of it that aren't moved over to the DAC permissions quite yet but they've been designing this from the beginning to run as a DAC, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, and another one is Uplift Nation, uh, which is a, a charity pretty much. And th that's one of these DACs that I'm actually really considering joining and participating more in because I've, I love their cause and I think it's an amazing opportunity. Awesome, very, very cool. Yeah, I've had numerous conversations with them at different conferences and stuff. It's, it's very, very cool. Yeah, it's sweet. Um, so that's, that's EOS DAC, that's the DAC factory. Uh, how is it participating in, in a DAC? How, how is the everyday, like a week, a month? What, what are you guys doing? That's a great question. And, and I'll, I'm going to go, as we were talking earlier, I'm always this radically transparent person. So I'll be fully transparent as well. You know, it's not easy. It's very challenging. You know, it's been two plus years with the EOS DAC community. And it's been, you know, in some ways, 
a little discouraging to not see that in continual progress of development, continual progress of the community participating and saying, hey, I would like to step up and add this value this way and the other. And a lot of, you know, there was a lot of discouragement with, in our particular case, with the EOS DAC token losing value, with the, you know, position in the EOS block production. We were one of the founding block producers that launched the chain, losing that paid position at times made it very difficult to reward people that were adding value to EOS DAC. So there was a kind of this sense of like, and also the the long bull, you know, uh, bear market that we kind of went through that yeah. whole time. So it was a sense of like, are we ever going to make progress with this? You know, and, and the technology being very difficult to work with. If you've built on EOSIO, specifically the mainnet, you know how challenging it can be. You know, the technology is constantly changing out from under you. You know, you set up your your API scrapers and your fillers and everything else, and then things break and change. And and so it's 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 been a little discouraging, you know, on some regard. And, and at the same time, you know, there's no other, other option, right? There's no better solution and anything worth doing is hard. And so there's been this kind of sense of like, I've done as, as much as I could do personally to help EOS stack. And then I've been really excited. For example, Stuardo has stepped up in a big way to be involved in the technical, leading the technical team. And so I've kind of stepped back a little bit and I'm more involved in feel what I've been doing now. And that's been really great to see. You know, I've, I, I haven't done videos like I've done in the past talking about EOSDAC because I was not wanting to, you know, I always want to under promise and over deliver. And I don't want to talk about the DAC factory if you can't use it yet. Right. And month after month, it was kind of like new challenges would show up either in the, in the EOSDAC technology stack or the EOS mainnet technology stack, you know, like deferred transactions recently just totally broke and that broke the entire, you know, DAC model. So that was another blow that was frustrating. You'd be like, okay, that's, there's nothing we can do about that. They just got to get it fixed. And, you know, shout out to EOS Nation who came up with a solution to, you know, process those deferred transactions. But it's it's challenging, but I would say it's it's a challenge worth fighting. You know, there's so many centralized solutions today that are systemic risk in so many ways. This is the, this is the future. I, I strongly believe it. Yeah, and I, I hope we can have some or even more legal backing to to governing a DAC in, in the, our society as a large. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so that's perfect. So let's go. Let's go to the FIO now. Uh, let's start with the foundation. And you already mentioned before what the goal for with FIO is to to enable mass adoption, really, with crypto to make it easy. Uh, is that the true purpose of FIO? Yes, um, I, I would start by explaining what FIO is. So FIO is may at this point three main features you have a field address which is just a human readable address like luke at stokes or luke at edge you know whatever domain you want and then you have a field request which is the ability for me to say hey i'd like you to send me cryptocurrency and in the normal financial world and based on my history in the financial world that's how all things start you know you go to a website you check out they give you an invoice so you can pay for your order or you need to pay rent or you need to split split the bill for a meal it always starts as a request and prior to this, there hasn't been a mechanism for that across all chains and all wallets to do that. So it's a protocol level to provide field addresses, field requests, and then field data as well. So in that request, you can include structured data. You can link out to the data with a hash. You can do a lot of interesting things. Whereas, you know, before, you know, some blockchains support memos and some don't, this provides a ubiquitous layer of usability that's the same for everybody. And so those are the main features of it. And the idea being prior to having those features available, cryptocurrency public keys are very confusing. Uh, they're, they're, they stress people out. You know, people use QR codes, for example, which are unencrypted. Yeah. And you have the opportunity for a man in the middle attack where I say, hey, you know, I'd like you to pay me some Bitcoin and I email you my Bitcoin address or I text you my Bitcoin address and you, you get the message and you're like, okay, cool. And you send off the Bitcoin. And then I'm like, hey man, are you gonna pay me or what? And you're like, I already did. So little did you know, a man in the middle came into that communication, was able to swap out your Bitcoin address with their Bitcoin address. And there was no cryptographically secure way to ensure that I was sending to the right person. Yeah. And in uh, PGP, public and private key encryption, they would have things called key signing parties. Where a bunch of people would get together and say, this is my public key. This is my identity. This is me. You know, it's me. Now that you have my public key through this ceremony of transferring over to you in a key signing party, you now know that this is me and you've validated it's me. And, and it just blows my mind how much crypto is lost in the world today because people are not doing that securely. They're not having a secure way to get someone's private or, or their public key to you so that you can send to them with your private key. So FIO provides for that. By, if, if I say, hey, send a FIO request to Lucas Stokes, 
I know that it's going to come from your field address. You know, your public address is available to me. Like you were, you were going to, you're going to put on this on the screen here. This is my proxy account. So everyone knows yeah. that is your proxy account. No one else controls that account, but you, because you have the private key for that. Yeah. So if somebody's, if that proxy account sends a field request to me, I absolutely know that it's you because no one else has the, the private key to be able to do that. And when I respond, you know, it's me because I control that account as well. It's like an NFT. So I'm very excited about how that solves that usability problem from the confusingness with public addresses, but also solves the key exchange problem that a lot of other solutions don't. And then a lot of people talk about, well, isn't it just wallet naming? You know, there's, there's Handshake and there's ENS and there's, you know, all these other solutions that are trying to do, you know, unstoppable domains. They're kind of doing wallet naming and they're also kind of toying with decentralized DNS, which is great, a really good, important problem that has to be solved. But I feel like DNS is inherently public. You need to know what those IP, are, IP addresses are in order to look them up. Whereas wallet naming should be as private as possible. So we are taking a focus on just wallet naming, not DNS. And we're also taking it a step further to say wallet naming alone doesn't solve the usability problem. By adding field requests and field data, you have a much better user experience. This is really important. So that, that's awesome. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a good starting point. Uh, and you mentioned field domains. So we need to start there. What's a field domain? A field domain can be any string of text that is kind of, if you look at a field address, it's like username, an at symbol, and then a domain. Yeah. So for example, I mentioned earlier, Luke at Stokes. Stokes would be the domain and the username would be Luke. And so because I own the Stokes domain, I currently have that domain as uh, private, but it could be, for example, you know, Walmart or Amazon or whatever domain, and they could have a signup process where anybody could get a username on that domain. For example, right now, the Edge wallet, which is a fully integrated field wallet they have the ability to get free FIO addresses on the Edge domain. So I also have Luke at Edge. I have Luke Stokes at Edge. And <laughs> it's, it's just different personalities and personas I could create in different ways, depending on which cryptocurrency addresses I want to map. You know, I can have one for spending cash or I can have one for my exchange deposit once the exchanges start integrating FIO. You know, I can have different addresses for different purposes. What is the limit about with domains? As far as the character count? Yeah, exactly, and in, in creating them. Yeah, and I think an entire field address is 64 characters. And so you can shift that every which way you want. So you could be a one character username with an at symbol, and then you'd have 62 left for the domain or vice yeah. versa. You know, you could have a tiny domain and, and a bunch of characters on the username, but all in all it's 64 characters. And as far as the limitations, the main features are either setting it public or private. And then there is a, a renewal process every year as well. So we're kind of going for about $40 a year is what we think a domain is worth. And then every time, every year, if you want to keep that domain, you'd renew it again. Otherwise, there's a kind of a, a blackout period where no one can use it until you repay it or renew it. And then at some point, it eventually gets burned off. So it's available for, for others. Yeah. And that is something unique that uh, for me, when I first found out about it, I had to sit down and try to understand this because that was something completely new in this, uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, and if I... Now for a user, okay, you pay the $40, $40 for your FIO domain, you get your domain that is uh, Anders at NEO. Like, I have NEO.io, well, well, so. Well, you could, have, uh, you could have the address. So a FIO address is separate than a domain. And a lot of them, they talk about it as domains. So I want to clarify the difference. An address is only $2 a year. And that's actually something we're giving away for free right now. There's 125 million tokens on the chain uh, actually coded to only be useful for field address giveaways. So you can't use them as a currency, you can't transfer them. The foundation controls those, but they can only be used for creating addresses. And so we're doing a large giveaway, kind of like PayPal did a giveaway to get up people on boarded. And with that process, you then get also what's called bundled transactions. So you get a hundred bundled transactions with each address, each FIO address that you get. So what's really nice about that is unlike Ethereum, we have to pay gas fees or Bitcoin, you have to pay all these fees, any interaction with the FIO chain just kind of happens behind the scenes. You don't even think about it because you prepaid for those interactions with those bundled transactions. So you can have a domain, which is kind of more novelty, kind of like getting a custom license plate or something like yeah. that. And then you can have a FIO address, which is the username on that domain. So if I own a domain, I can make it public and people can pay two, $2 to use to get their ad address and they don't need to care about the domain. Is that what you exactly, meant? Exactly, exactly. And that address could be, you know, that is again, not paid to some central entity. There's no, there's no group that collects that other than the blockchain. So that's 85% of those fees go to the block producers. 
10% uh, of those go to the technology provider ID, which is the wallet or exchange that does that interaction. And then 5% goes back to the foundation to continue developing the protocol, doing marketing, promoting the protocol, things of that nature. And then and there's actually an additional 40% called new user bounties. I think those are another 125 million tokens that are set aside to give an additional benefit until those tokens run out to those wallet providers so that there's a huge incentive right now. If you're, let's say you do a big address giveaway to 100,000 users on your wallet or your exchange, and let's say those are $2 each, but they're just given away for free, with that 40% and that 10%, that's 50% of that gets minted. 10% uh, is the fees and 40% gets minted. So that would be a dollar per user. So you could make like a million dollars in FIO tokens, for example, if you were to do a million uh, address giveaways. So it's pretty exciting opportunities from a financial standpoint for those who want to integrate the protocol. Yeah, for sure. And, and worth adding is that uh, what differentiates FIO from Depots for a user is that each transaction has a cost, which it doesn't have on EOS or WAX or, or things like that. But as you yeah, said, got, you, when you have this bundle of transactions. Uh, yeah, we've gotten rid of all the complexities that currently hinder adoption of a lot of EOS IO chains, where it's like, I have to pay for EOS account before I can even use EOS. And then I have to worry about RAM and staking and CPU. And it's just for most everyday people, it's just way too complicated. They're like, I can't even figure this out. So one of the neatest innovations of FIO is you can generate a public private key, key, key pair. And once you have that, as soon as you send FIO to that address, it actually generates the actual account, the EOS IO account under the hood, and you never have to worry about it. And you never have to worry about resources, staking, RAM, all that's taken care of behind the scenes. So every single action on chain has a fee, but most of those that, that are common that people are gonna be using take that fee out of your bundle transactions. So as long as you're not doing you know, more than 100 transactions in a given year, you won't even notice at all that the, that the, the chain itself has fees other than the transfer. I think it's, uh, it used to be two FIO. I think they just adjusted it to 0.7 FIO. I should I say they, I should say you. you, all, <laughs> you know, adjusted the fees to make it more reasonable. We're looking to be around you know, 10, 15 cents or so as a, as a transaction fee, because that is actually the most expensive, one of the most expensive actions on chain right now because it has to create that account when you transfer to a new address. And that is a permanent amount of data that you all have to pay for with your servers as block producers. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and that, all of this is very neat. But one question that we need to answer before we move forward is, you said that there's a cost for an account, there's a cost for a domain. What happens when this run out? Do I lose my crypto? No, definitely not. Uh, it's a really good point. The public private key pair on FIO is where your crypto is stored. And that'll never change. So you have your private key for your FIO tokens and, and an associated public key. And a public key is the thing that starts with FIO and a whole long string of numbers. An address is something that you then attach to that public private key pair. And then when you attach other blockchains to that address, those remain on the other blockchain. So it's also important to recognize that FIO doesn't transfer Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these others. It doesn't even get involved in the transaction in any way. It's just a usability layer on the wallet. So that when you go into the wallet, like Edge Wallet, for example, and you say, okay, I want to I want to do a field request for Ethereum or an ERC-20 token from someone, that right up to the point where you actually send the token is interacting with field blockchain. And the moment you won't go to send the token, it's just doing a native Ethereum token. You'll still have to you know, pay the Ethereum gas fees and all that kind of stuff. It's just a usability layer. But yeah, you do not need to have a field address in order to send or receive tokens. But when we did surveys and we talked about it, we feel that $2 a month, or I'm sorry, $2 a year is, you know, well worth it to most people as far as the usability they get. And the nice thing about that is there's no central entity that decides that. If the community of field people and block producers decide, you know, it's too expensive or it's not, you know, maybe it needs to be more expensive because the block producers aren't being properly incentivized to continue securing the network. Whatever the decision is, they can make those changes. And the nice thing about it is it's not attached to the price of the field token. So as the FIO token goes up and down and fluctuates, you all can change the fees and the multiplier to make sure that it's still a reasonable cost for someone who wants to use a FIO address. Yeah, and we had some fun with the fees on the test that me and Josep did some interesting testing where we dumped all the fees and, and then we went up crazy. So uh, I suggested that it should cost millions to do a transaction. 
Uh, yeah, I saw some of that, which is like, <laughs> that's, that's what's the fun part of a test net is really kind of yeah. throwing stuff at it, making sure those median calculations are done right. And as you were talking about earlier with your proxy, it's also really important to participate in the governance because that's going to be something people can signal and say, hey, you know, I'm running really good, really secure equipment and hardware for my servers. And, you know, maybe I got a great discount on it and I'm distributed in multiple uh, nodes across the world, you know, so I can actually provide a competitive bid to say, I think the fee should be a little lower. Because yeah. that gives me an advantage as a block producer because I have better infrastructure at a better cost than other people. So there's all these factors that are going to go into how the people continue to govern the chain, which I'm really excited to see unfold. Yeah, and, and for us as example, uh, if you go to uh, to rent the server, rent uh, something in the cloud or whatever, you can get the block producer for around 80 to $200, depending on where it is. Uh, and, and that, then if we go there, it doesn't sound that expensive for a month, but then you may need a backup and you, and, and so, but what we have done is we bought all hardware and we run it 100% ourselves. So we have hardware for several hundred thousands of dollars running uh, that we own. So we can easily uh, go up and go down in scale with our production. And we know that if we need to upgrade something, if we need to turn something off, if we need to, to add more, we can easily do that. Uh, which we continue doing. Uh, Vahid, our CEO, isn't as happy about buying new hardware as Eric is, uh, but he he and I love it, so it's it's fine. <laughs> Eric is universally known in the space as as having uh, almost a fetish of wanting to buy the latest and greatest and have the most amazing hardware on the planet. And Vahid is also an amazing human being, where he you know he, he's got a business mind that I appreciate. So you guys, you guys have done an amazing job on all the different chains that you represent. And I just, I, I so appreciate your, your efforts as well, because that is really an important aspect that not all block producers are the same, you know, yeah. not the hardware that they run, the, you know, whether they're out there in the cloud or what, or more importantly, I think even their technical excellence, you know, Eric and others who really understand the code, if something's not working well, they can tell you exactly where the problem is and what to do about it. Uh, he recently, you guys were a really big help with our test net where we actually you know, unborked, <laughs> unboinked, we actually reset the FIO test net because we're testing a really important system upgrade that we have coming. And it was really great to have your guys help and really show the team that we have at DAPIX, you know, that the foundation is working with to say, look, you can just entrust this decentralized group of block producers to take things and run with them. And we had a small meeting and you guys did that and it was fantastic. Yeah, Eric, Eric is a hero. He, he, he breeds EOS IO for sure. He, he has he has tested all optimizations that one can test and uh, before P, uh, EOSI wor works best on Intel's Intel CPUs but way before we even 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 started to explore other things he started to try to to run it on AMD as to see what's the benefit what's the what's the what's not the benefit from doing that uh, and when when EOS we needed like 16 gigs of RAM on on devices to to run producers we like okay let's have 768 gigs of ram on our producer and we know that we are safe for a while so th that's how crazy things go, go and now we use that um, machine mainly for apis because uh the data for apis is is intense um, oh yeah it's massively intense and for those who don't understand infrastructure if you get anywhere near 512 gigs of ram i mean you're an astronomically expensive range very few people even can run a server at 700 or more. I mean, that's hats off to you guys. You've always been known as running really reliable APIs, full history APIs, full nodes, all these different things that are critically important to the infrastructure of the space. So I'm just, I'm very, very proud to have you guys involved with Theo. Uh, I, you know, when I reached out to all my friends in the EOS IO space and the Steam Hive space and said, hey guys, we're doing this cool thing. I'd love to have you on board. Uh, it, it was just so gratifying personally to have so many people recognize the value in what we're doing and to show up and say, this is cool. Yeah, the, the industry does need this. We do need a protocol that's kind of shared by all the blockchains and we need something that's high performant and secure, which, you know, and we need something that's decentralized. We don't want to have like, you know, the pay ID or some of these other solutions that are just, you lock yourself into whatever that vendor is. And if, you know, if they want to jack up the prices or, or charge you something or, or worse yet, deal with your personal data and your metadata in a way you don't like, you know, you don't have any control over that. So. Very, very excited. The, the group of block producers we brought together. I think it's one of the best in the industry right now. Yeah, there's a, there's a, for sure a few few teams that are really talented here. Um, and as you said before, it's open for more. So more talented people can come and participate. Uh, 
And what you just said about vendors, uh, that's one of the biggest benefits from my perspective with using domains. Can you go into how? Yeah. So, for example, let's say, uh, you know, Amazon or Walmart or one of these big uh, stores wants to offer a domain, you know, at Amazon. And then I could be a customer at Amazon. And that way, so we actually have an example of this. You could look at uh, shop.fioprotocol.io. It's an example where you can check out, you can buy, uh, you can buy like a little, uh, little, little face diaper, a little COVID mask if you want, you know, you could buy uh, stickers and, and shirts and stuff. And it's that checkout experience is with a field request. So you say, here's what I want to, the currency I want to pay and here's the amount and you hit the button and then you pull up your phone and it's like, oh, okay, you just see the fee request and it has all the details, shows exactly the amount you're gonna pay, the token you're gonna pay and you just swipe and you're done. And it's really a seamless experience. And from my checkout experience with Foxycart building e-commerce stores, this was something that was really meaningful to me. And so the idea being that a lot of these gigantic companies that are sitting on the sidelines, some of them even have blockchain subdivisions. They're actually analyzing blockchain technology and DLT technology. And they're looking at it going, okay, it's cool and all, we see the benefits of it, but we're just not gonna introduce it yet to our customers. And I believe it's because they don't have a usability layer that makes sense. They're not gonna like walk people through how to use MetaMask or how to figure out their public and private key. It's just too confusing. And shout out to Wax and what they've been doing, you know, with that single login with Facebook and stuff. They're just trying to make things easier so I, I'm thinking that these larger stores that know they eventually have to get into blockchain or they're going to have their, their industry disrupted as a centralized entity, but at the same time are waiting for some usability layer to make it simpler, I'm hopeful they're going to see FIO and that branding attachment to the domain as being really valuable. So for example, a lot of people still use their AOL email address. <laughs> and it's just so funny to me. It's like, I liked AOL because it introduced me to the internet, but then eventually I got onto the real internet, right? And I think that if people get introduced to blockchain through a FIO address that's branded for their domain, it's very possible they'll continue using that off into the future as they branch out from that you know, one particular walled garden. And just to clarify again, using a FIO domain, is that a custodian way of uh, handling crypto? It is, it is completely self-sovereign. So you control yeah. the private key for that FIO address and that FIO domain. And I should also mention the FIO domains are NFTs essentially. And we have some features we're going to be rolling out so that eventually you'll be able to trade those on OpenSea, for example. That's one of the things that we want to have. So you have full control of that domain and that address. You can transfer it between accounts, things of that nature, once we get these uh, improvements in place. But the mapping of addresses to that is completely under your control. So that way, if you're you know, going to allow you know, someone to send you Bitcoin or someone to send you Ethereum or EOS or whatever chain you could possibly imagine, you're the only one that can control how that mapping goes. So Lucat Stokes, I can map different things, I, different addresses for different cryptocurrencies to go to different places because I control that address. So let's say I have this, um, this store, uh, I, I sell uh, uh, wine glasses. That, that's what that's why I sell. And uh, I have Anders at wine, that's my domain. I, I was lucky enough to get the wine domain. Uh, I haven't even checked if that's available. But anyway, the, the wine domain, and I will want to be able to offer my glasses for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Wax, EOS, Fio. Uh, the end user is everything they will see is the store at wine or Anders at wine or whatever I use. Yep. It could be orders at wine and that would yeah. be it. And it's just send your, send your thing to orders at wine or better yet, as we demonstrated in the shop.field protocol website, it asks for your field address and say, okay, I'm going to put in Luke at Stokes and I want to pay with Bitcoin. And yeah. then I, I hit the button and I get a notification right in my wallet. It says, Hey, here's the, here's the, a uh, person orders at wine and here's the, the description of the wine you're buying and here's the amount, here's the exact thing. And you say, yeah, it's all good. I know I'm sending it to the right person. I, I swipe it and now they get the cryptocurrency. And that is what I'm, I, what I found amazing about Theo when I started to look at it, uh, because that's the use case that is needed right now. Copying and pasting private keys sucks. EOS IO did it better, but people are still making mistakes. Uh, one of the interviews, I, I don't want to push him too much, but he sent $50,000 worth of Steam to the wrong name. And then we we have readable names. So that is a small typo. And we see that on EOS. We see it on Wax all the time. People send it to, instead of who be deposit, it's who be the police or, or something like that. It's, it's one yes. letter wrong and then it's gone and, and they lost it. So people make mistakes, even though it's easy to, to check it. Uh, and even the, the knowledgeable people do these mistakes. 
I know. And I, I've been in this space for seven and a half years and I still get stressed out, you know, checking, double checking, triple checking. Is that really the right address that I, you know, and then you have to do a test send and then you have to do a real send. You know, I, I sent, I sent probably the largest FIO request response last night. Uh, it was, I think it was 50,000 FIO. I had a vendor that I had to pay and they sent a FIO request and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. But I can, I didn't have to do a test send first. I knew exactly who this was. I'd already interacted with them. I knew this was their FIO address and it was just beautiful to send it off and know they were gonna get it. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a, a much improved security perspective. And oftentimes when you increase security, you sacrifice usability. Yeah. And what I love about the FIO experience is it, it provides both much better usability experience and much more security. And those two together are a rare combo that I'm, I'm really, really proud of. Yeah, that's great. And, and the, the cryptocurrencies you support, is there any limits there? There are zero limits. And that's a beautiful thing. FIO itself as a protocol doesn't actually interact directly with any actual blockchain. And the beauty about that except is- one. <laughs> well, except its own, exactly. Except, other than the FIO chain, I don't have to integrate with Bitcoin in some way. It only is a wallet layer solution. So basically, if you're a cryptocurrency and you're seeing this and you're thinking, man, that sounds so great. How can I have that user experience for my cryptocurrency? All you have to do is find a wallet that supports your cryptocurrency and get them to integrate FIO. So that's my big call to action to anyone who sees this video, the entire cryptocurrency space. Please go out there and get your favorite wallets, exchanges, payment gateways, get them to know about FIO. Send them a link to FIO Protocol IO. Send them a link to me directly and I'll have a conversation with them. Get them to realize the benefit of integrating the FIO Protocol, not only the financial benefits because of all those rewards we were talking about as far as fees, but also the user experience benefit. And, and you, I think as end users are gonna be the driving force for these entities to implement this because they've got their development roadmaps, they're doing other things and, and they're gonna go with whatever's easiest or whatever makes sense. And it's going to come down to the users demanding a, a private, secure, self-sovereign solution like FIO to say, hey, we want this usability. We want it to be consistent across all the different products and services we use. We don't want some central entity controlling it. We want it decentralized and distributed. So we really want you to integrate this. And, you know, if you guys could do that, I think we'd have a, a whole different world as far as the cryptocurrency space in the future. And if anyone wants to, to OK, now we're here. This sounds amazing. Does anyone trust this? What, where did you just got listed? few days ago oh, we just got listed on binance so that's a, that's our big news it's, big, it's, it's a big stamp like shake okay fio is one of the first okay you're not you are based on eos io but you have done a lot of changes so i wouldn't say it's eos io anymore it's a it's a big fork it's a big change but you are one yeah. of the first eos io chains that got accepted onto binance and, and that's a that's a big check mark it is the largest exchange centralized exchange on the in the world today and on top of that they uh, invested in the early rounds of Binance Labs invested in Dapix, which is the company that built the first version of the FIO protocol. So there's a lot of, you know, industry leaders that recognize this as being really important and worthwhile. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really been an exciting moment for our whole team uh, to see the, the token launch, to see the community support the token. The activity has been phenomenal. And, and as you, I'm sure you understand, but probably is helpful for your users, when people talk about blockchain, sometimes they're like, well, I like blockchain technology, it's cool and all, but I'm just not really into the whole token cryptocurrency thing. And I think it's really important to recognize that the value of the cryptocurrency is what secures the immutability of the blockchain. And that's what gives the blockchain value. If you don't have a valuable token, you're not gonna have valuable governance over the blockchain to secure that token. And so it's really, really important that if even if we have this great project with FIO, but no one's interested in the token, then there will be a disincentive situation with the block producers to secure the network and you won't be able to trust it as much as you can. And so I'm, I'm very, very excited with this, even in this early days, the way the market has responded to the value of the ecosystem via the tokenization. Yeah, for sure. It's very exciting. And it it, it has gone fast. Uh, the last few weeks has been very exciting for anyone that has a few FIO tokens. Uh, Oh, definitely. I, so I, I, I actually recently updated my little script that I run. I wrote a little PHP script to see how much uh, the block producers have been paid. And I adjusted it to show it in US dollar value. I'm like, dang, <laughs> money. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys are, are pretty excited about the value yeah. uh, for your efforts. Because I know a lot of you guys have been working, you know, even till, you know, some in some cases last year, you know, working to get us to this point so we can have a mainnet launch in March that we had and a continued operation. I know we lean on you guys really heavily in the testnet. There's daily conversations going on. 
and what's neat is there's a lot of excitement about it. In a lot of situations, you know, you, you don't want to push a rope, right? You always you yeah. gotta you know, pull people along and be like, this is this is something we need your help with. And because of the high token price and the interesting things we're doing, it's been exciting to see the people say, yeah, this is cool. I'm I'm happy to participate. So I appreciate it. Yeah, and and it's good. I mean, I mean, uh, our team is involved in a lot of different projects and. It's exciting, but it's hard to put in a lot of time if it doesn't give back some value so we can pay. I mean, we have four people. We need to pay salaries. We need to pay for all the... Our, we have a lot of equipment. It needs a lot of power, internet access, different locations that we need to pay for. And if we can't cover this, we need to focus on working on other things. And and what FIO is enabling us, it's okay, now we have income here. Now we can put in more power, more effort to work with this, this project, which is awesome. Uh, we try to help and, and support as many projects as we can because we believe we may not know what will actually be big, but we want to support. We have hardware and this is what we offer. We can go and help you and you can play with your idea. You can explore it and see if it works. If we don't get anything for it, it's fine. But if we get something for it, we go in further and we actually start to contribute even more. And I mean, we, we host APIs for I don't know how many chains now, probably 10 or something. Uh, and our internal tests, I don't want to to drop the numbers on how many requests we can handle per second, but uh, uh, feel free to try to to reach the limits. Uh, we have no rate I, limit on them. <laughs> I would I would say that you guys have been you know universally known in the space as providing uh, phenomenal levels of performance, security, and uptime. I mean, I I can't say how happy I am to have you guys involved in this chain because I, I do know your reputation is phenomenal as far as your, your technical excellence and performance you provide. And again, it's one of those things that if this becomes what we believe it to become, if this becomes the industry standard for the entire space with lots of cryptocurrency transactions, deposits, withdrawals on exchanges, transfers between wallets, moving NFTs around, if these all start to become all the DeFi stuff that's going on, if that starts to happen on the FIO chain, as far as the FIO usability layer being involved, you know, it's going to be a lot of transactions, it's going to be a lot of performance needed. And thankfully, we've got a technology in EOS IO that can handle it. And we've got a solid group of block producers like yourselves that can handle it. So super yeah. appreciate you guys. And, and in case we start to reach some limit, we can uh, easily upgrade it. We, we can, can get more equipment and we can move things around to optimize it. So uh, we track these numbers and, and that is why I, I have two phones. Um, <laughs> one, one phone screams at me if I need to work and, and that's a 24 seven job for almost two years now. Um, oh yeah, so, I, I know this well <laughs> with, with both Steam Hive and EOS DAC. It's it's I know this very well, and and you guys are much much appreciated. Yeah, uh, and you you mentioned the DAPIX team, the, the and how has it been to work with them? They've been a phenomenal team. It's been really interesting because in the beginning, I was uh, I was at a conference I think in I think it was in Denver, and I was I was sitting there. It was like a two or three day conference. And I think OCI hosted, it was like how to set up your nodes and stuff. And I actually, funny thing is I thought it was a, a two day conference on, it was like a pre-conference to another conference. And I thought it was gonna be a, a, a thing talking about how to write smart contracts. And I programmed in a half a dozen you know languages professionally, but I've never done C++. So I was like looking forward to it. I show up and I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is, this isn't uh, smart contracts. This is, you know, how to run your nodes. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do this. So there was uh, Eugene from EOS Tribe was there and um, and uh, from OCI, I'm, I'm totally forgetting his name. Um, you would know who I who I mean if I mentioned him. He's been, a, he's given a bunch of talks. Anyway, um, they were there presenting. And so since I kind of already knew how to do it, I just kind of helped out the staff there. And, and I didn't know that the chief product officer for Dapix was there, Pablo. So as I was just kind of helping him, he realized like, hey, this guy really knows his EOS IO stuff. Maybe we should talk to him. So then at the conference, I had a lunch with him and the CEO, David Gold. And through that process, learned about their project and was just like, oh, wow, this is great. So they worked closely, closely with OCI to get onboarded on EOS IO and learn more about it. They've got, we've got a diverse team of blockchain developers and kind of you know, more old school, high end uh, systems and distributed system developers as well through our, our chief architect. So I'm, I'm Excited about the, the dynamic nature of it. And they're also been learning very fast. You know, there's a lot to learn in the EOS IO world. Yeah. It's been really great also to kind of get the communication between DAPIX and the block producers increasing more and more. And I'm trying to open up kind of this traditionally centralized VC-backed company 
to facilitate more of a worker proposal DAC DAO model that Theo and the foundation is going to morph into. So, I mean, just yesterday we had a great call about the tools we use. You know, we use Jira and Confluence and all these other tools and, and moving towards more open participation and tools where the block producers and the wallets and exchanges can directly participate because ultimately we want this ownership to be across the whole industry. So everybody involved in FIO considers it theirs, not some other entity that's providing this blockchain, but really something that they get to participate in directly. So the DAPX team has been phenomenal. Uh, um, Casey, Todd, Adam, Ed, I could go on and on with Eric, Pavel, I mean, just really great group of people. Uh, Andrew, uh, Sean, it's just like they, they've been doing a really good job working really hard. John in our marketing department's got a lot of cool programs and giveaways he's been able to come up with. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. And I'm looking forward to kind of as time evolves, more and more people participating via our worker proposals. So it's not just going to be, you know, the primary service provider DAPX who got us here. It's going to be a whole number of people adding value to the network. Yeah, and worth adding there is out of all the projects we are involved with, uh, FIO is the one pushing updates on the blockchain system most frequently right now. It's, uh, it's I wouldn't say daily, but it's weekly updates all the time now. Um, and it, yeah, we and have, it's, not, it, it's not just a small wording, it's, it's, it's large changes. We, yeah, we have a significant number of improvements we want to go forward with because we knew that you know, ultimately, if we waited till it was perfect, we never would have launched, right? You have to you have to launch early enough that you're not exactly proud of your, your <laughs> kind of ugly baby, right? But then not so early that, uh, you know, it's not functional. And so I'm very proud that FIO requests, FIO data, and FIO addresses are fully supported right now. And then there's other things we want to do, you know, secure routing of multi-sig transactions, subscriptions, so many other things that we can evolve into. And so our approach was like, you know, let's launch as early as we can. There were some pretty important security and privacy features that's in FIT5. And I would love for you guys to take that a look at that at a deeper level. I'd love Eric to take a look at it as well. There's a lot of, uh, we have these FIPs, they're called FIO improvement proposals. And we're all, all the way up to, I think, 13 or 14 now. And FIT5 is the really big one. That's the one that is going to take a lot of effort, uh, both from the block producers to evaluate, but also to build out and the wallets and exchanges to implement. But we feel it's important because it's it's really unique in that you and I could interact with a FIO request on chain completely without any metadata being released about you and I interacting. So you'd be, you'd actually be looking on chain for a shared key and you would be able to extract encrypted information off chain and know that it's from me to you without anyone else being able to know that. So it's some really exciting uh, features that we want to keep adding and improving. And we got many other things to go forward with. So I do see it as something that's going to be continually evolving and improving, but it's going to be, uh, you know, we, we, we are only going to move as fast as we should, right? As, as we talked about, you move too quickly and, and you, you end up having to unboink some uh, test nuts now and again. Yeah, it's like this, the, the upgrade we're doing now, it's, it's a, one step at a time and moving forward uh, to minimize the issues and, and that's perfect. Um, and if we go here, if I'm a community member, I'm a token holder, I'm a believer of crypto, how can I get involved? Excellent question. And that's, we are carving our kind of funnel as far as our different personas, right? We have, you know, wallets and exchanges who want to integrate the protocol. We have block producers who want to participate. We've got token holders and investors and speculators who want to, you know, learn about the protocol and whether they want to financially support it. And then we've got users, just cryptocurrency users. And that's the main one that I'm excited about. And so the process right now, I would say is go to FIO protocol, F-I-O protocol.io. And there's going to be a link there to get yourself a free address. And we'll list out the different wallets that support FIO protocol and enable you to get a FIO address on their domain. Uh, one that I really enjoy is the Edge Wallet. Paul Poy and his team are amazing. They're on the board. Paul's on the board with FIO. And the Edge Wallet is a really great experience. So you can download an Edge Wallet, get your free FIO address on the Edge domain, and then start interacting with other cryptocurrency community members by sending your first FIO request. So the next time you need to send crypto or you need to receive crypto from someone, ask them to walk through the process saying, hey, I want to send you that Ethereum, but first go ahead and download Edge Wallet, get it all set up and send me a FIO request because that way that key exchange is going to be real secure. And then the next step, if you want to go a little further, is check out that demo shop. And it's actually a real working e-commerce store, shop.feoprotocol.io. You know, buy yourself a sticker or something. And you know, we're just running that at cost to demonstrate how it works. And you can, you know, check out with a field request. It's a really exciting experience to recognize like, oh man, this is how easy cryptocurrency should be. That's amazing. And of course, like if you want to, for your users and your listeners of this show, go ahead and set up a domain for your show. And I'd be happy to do a big field address giveaway. You can do contests, you know, where people can set up a field address as users of, you know, uh, 
community members of your community show that you're building here. And they can, you can do giveaways, you can do all kinds of uh, different, you know, quizzes, for example, where they could, or you could do votes, you know, vote on which show you like the best, send it as a field request, and only you'll be able to see that data. So you could tabulate all the votes, you know, really cool ideas. Once you have a field request enabled community, you can do some really exciting stuff with them on a marketing and promotion standpoint. So if you ever want to do an address giveaway, let me know. Yeah, and probably what, what I'm actually doing right now on Twitter is that people that engage with me on Twitter, they get experience points and they get levels. Uh, so if they share my content, if they retweet, if they comment, they, and everything like this adds experience to their profile, and then they level up. And the higher up they get, they can they get access to different rooms on Discord. So this is something nice. that I just started. I'm testing out all the backend and everything, and that makes sense that when you reach a certain level, you will be able to get this special domain that is mine. Uh, Heck, so, yeah. so that will be something that is rewarded when you reach a certain level and not for everyone. And that's probably how I want to keep it because I want to be able to give back to those that support me. And, and with this experience and level, I'm actually minting special NFTs on WAX and giving out to, to them reaching. So they can use them, they can sell them, they can save them or whatever. And I think that we need more of this uh, engagement with the community uh, as we go forward. That sounds awesome. I love that gamification. I think that's what tokenomics and performant blockchains make possible. And the cool thing about that is you could have special contests and special giveaways that would only be for people at your domain, right? Yes. You could say, if you've reached this highest level in the gamification, now I'm giving away $100 in wax tokens, or I'm giving away this, you know, this really important Splinterlands card, or I'm giving away this, you know, really great wax NFT. And, and only these highest group of people get to participate. So everyone send me a fear request who wants it. And I'll pick a random one on the a live on air on the show. And I'll, I'll respond to your fear request and, and send you out your, your reward. Uh, that would be super awesome. Yeah, so that, that is where we're going. And, and sure, we are a little bit uh, away from that. We need to get some of these, these basic levels set up. But it's testing and people are getting experience points uh, already. So that, that's perfect. And shout out to Bounty Block, which is helping with these experience points. Uh, so it's, it's AOSIO based experience points, which is also nice. Very cool. I hope I get some experience points for being on the show. <laughs> if you re if you retweet <laughs> later when we share it, so for sure. I will for sure. Uh, so that's that's users how they can get engaged with Theo. How can a developer get engaged with Theo? Our our developer hub. So theoprotocol.io. There's the great knowledge base, which really has. It's awesome. Like everything. Yeah, everything you'd ever want to know about FIO is in the knowledge base. It's kind of like a living white paper. And importantly, there is actually a static white paper as well. We did outline the problem that we're trying to solve, kind of like the Bitcoin white paper. It's not really long, just like the Bitcoin white paper is only like nine pages. You know, so we have that white paper and then we have the knowledge base, which goes into the tokenomics, the token distribution, you know, all the different details explaining FIO addresses. A lot of what we discussed today is in the knowledge base. And then we have a really great developer hub as well. So if you understand kind of what it is, you can go right to that developer hub. There's a little video there explaining how to use it. And it has built into it a, a full functional testnet API. So as you're, as you're going through the different API calls, you can actually test run them, which is really kind of neat as a developer uh, to be able to play around directly with it. It has step-by-step -step instructions on the different opportunities. If you're a wallet, how to integrate and, and what phases to integrate, you know, sending to field requests, for example. Very, very easy to do. It's a simple lookup. So instead of, you know, just taking a Bitcoin address, you could also take a Luke at Stokes, do a lookup for it for the Bitcoin address, get the Bitcoin address, and then send it to the right person. There are certain things like that that would take very little time at all to start getting the integration going. And then if you're in a wallet, or I'm sorry, if you're an exchange, you have uh, other integration options for the deposit and withdrawal area. And so we walk through kind of even with screenshots, what that might look like for the wallets and exchanges. Uh, and then, of course, we're in Telegram. We have a Discord as well. Our, our team is always available to answer any kind of questions you have. We're happy to set up a shared channel in Telegram with our developers if, if you want to dive in deeper into some of the uh, technical details. But uh, we're always working as well to make that process easier. So like uh, Eugene, for example, at EOS Tribe, he just did the Thrive Wallet. He did that kind of all on his own and he spent a couple of weeks working on it and he got a fully FIO integrated wallet that he launched to the community, which is pretty exciting. And so it can be done quickly and he's a pretty good developer and some of them you know, might be quicker than others, but we're here to help either way. And any feedback we can get on how to make the process easier would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and your knowledge hub and, and this uh, FAQ or whatever you want to call them, uh, it's one of the best ones so far that I've seen in the blockchain space. Uh, 
It, Thank you so much. I, and that shout out yeah. to, to Pavo and Eric and the team. They've done an amazing job on that. And we're constantly updating it. Every time we get some feedback or some information for how we can make it easier, we're adding a, and reorganizing that information there. And that is the hardest part because you have to keep such a thing up to date. And that is a lot of work and a lot of work has been put in. So I will link to everything that we have discussed here, the how to set up a domain. And, and I will link to the page on, on the knowledge base, how the basic functions works and everything like that. So in the in the, com the section will probably be pretty long, but you will find everything you need there. Uh, so Fantastic. Awesome. And what's neat too is there's some really cool community people, community members that have started to put their own pages up. So you can go to like Theo.tools, for example, and they list out all these cool tools or Theo.wiki. Uh, Brad has put that up. At, uh, and, and then there's also uh, the Anchor team has done a great job with their Anchor wallet and their EOSIO signing protocol. So they have a Theo registration helper. So you can manage all your domains, all your addresses. You can renew your addresses and domains. You can do mappings and all that's done through the Anchor Wallet signing. So it's it's really, really neat to start seeing the community build out their own tools. Uh, another shout out to Aloha who has their uh, VP uh, voting tool. So you can see all the block producer voting yeah. stats. And then also the fee tool, which is really important as the block producers are adjusting fees. There's a way to be able to view what those fees are on chain. So. Very, very excited about all the community coming together to add tools to the space. Very, very cool. For sure it is. And uh, my my long-term plan is done on annuo.io. I will actually add uh, descriptions of the major projects that I believe in and support. So Fia will have a, a, a section there as well, especially when I launch a proxy to get people to, to find it and, and find the information they need. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much for this interview. It's been so great. We've covered so many different topics. I, ho I, hope, uh, I hope it was interesting enough for your viewers as well. I, I feel like we are talking about really important things for those <laughs> of you as well. You know, we've got to make crypto more usable. And yes. that's what we're trying to do. So, but thank you so much for the opportunity to share all this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And one more thing before we go, where is Fio in six months? Oh, wow. Fio in six months. I would love, and again, I'm completely speculating. I have no idea, but I would love to see it on you know, a half a dozen exchanges, you know, fully integrated in the deposit and withdraw area. I'd love to see, you know, a dozen or so great wallets fully integrated, maybe more. You know, I'd love to see people talking about FIO addresses more so than they ever talk about any kind of public addresses. That would, yeah. you know, I'd love to see influencers in the space being proud of their FIO address and doing giveaways with their community with FIO addresses. I think that would be phenomenal. That's what I'm hoping for in the next six months. That sounds amazing. So thank you, Luke, for your time. And I hope that a lot of people find value from this. Ah, thank you so much. Appreciate it.